a few words of introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Hubert Wempitsky. Uh, you can find me on Twitter if you want to torture yourself with my tweets. You can follow me. You don't have to check twice. Uh, I'm the co-owner of uh, Amberbit. Uh, we used to be a Ruby on Rails a web development company. Like many others, we, dis uh, we uh, figured out we want to switch to Elixir at some point because we discovered it and we just were so fascinated. That took us like two years to switch, but it has been successful. Um, and I came from Białystok, which is a city in northeastern Poland, and uh, it took me a really long time to get here. Uh, by the way, on the train, it's only slightly faster than that, so <laughs> be warned. Uh, I'm going to be sipping my coffee because I had a severe case of man cold uh, for the last week, and I had like 37 degrees, you know, so <laughs> almost terminal phase. Uh, so you have to excuse me if my voice is going to degrade a bit uh, during the talk. Today, uh, we're going to talk about uh, GraphQL uh, together with Elixir. Um, but first, let's talk a bit about GraphQL itself what it is, what, what it came to be, and, and how to use it. GraphQL has its roots in Facebook. It has its root, uh, roots in the Facebook backend, precisely. Uh, I don't know the precise story behind it, but from experience, from the educated guess, because we've built quite a number of backend frontend applications, I can tell you that the story was something like that. Uh, the front-end team came to the back-end team and requested some API endpoint, and the back-end team said, okay, we're going to implement it. Then a couple days later, or maybe a few days later, the endpoint was ready. And the front-end team asked, okay, but can we load a bit more data with that endpoint? And the back-end said, okay, yes, please, have a go. And then they came back again, but can we have an optionally some more data? So just have some... Uh, parameters to the uh, REST endpoint and maybe exclude some data so we want to save on the tr uh, bandwidth, you know? Uh, and the backend guy said, uh, yes, we can do that. You're ruining our beautiful API with all those optional uh, uh, parameters, but, but here you go. What, what are you going to do, right? So this kept going, this kept going and going, and, and the backend people, they were just doing those, those fixes, and the feedback loop has been so long that everybody was waiting for something and nobody has time for that, right? <laughs> the, the Facebook uh, has more important things to solve. And then somebody on the backend side of things had this aha moment, like, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they figured, why don't we just give them what, uh, some, something, some, some option to query our data source expose some data and let them fetch it as, as they want it. So they started hacking. Uh, they started hacking together the GraphQL, uh, first GraphQL implementation. That was how GraphQL has been born internally in Facebook in 2012. Again, that's a lucky guess, but uh, I think the backend developers, once they released, they've been like that, yeah, we're happy, we can now implement the real important stuff like, you know, integrations with Cambridge <laughs> Analytica. <laughs> Which, by the way, they could have easily done with GraphQL, so. <laughs> and uh, then a couple years later, uh, in 2015, I guess, or maybe 2014, they came to the management and said, can we open source it? Because uh, this is cool, can other people use it? And management had a look at the GraphQL, at the, the, at the implementation specification, and since GraphQL can be understood by both humans and machines, uh, <laughs> they agreed, right? <laughs> so, GraphQL has been made public in 2015. Uh, you could download a reference implementation, you could download the specification, and now you can enjoy it. What the hell is it this? A GraphQL thing. Um, it stands for Graph Query Language, right? Uh, seems obvious, but it's nothing much more than specification. It's a specification maintained uh, at Facebook. Um, it describes how you can query the data you want to retrieve and how you can modify the data, but also says uh, how you can get subscribed to be notified about the data changes. 
Uh, GraphQL itself uh, is a specification that's transport independent. In 99% of the cases, you're likely to use it together with HTTP API. So this can be used as a replacement for REST endpoints. Uh, wherever we have, we have REST API, you could expose some data through GraphQL uh, and, and the clients can use it in a similar manner. They, they're getting JSON, they're sending JSON. So it's like a replacement for REST APIs. But you can use it uh, over WebSocket. For example, if you have a low latency system you're building, I don't know, trading system maybe or whatever, you can just uh, expose GraphQL over WebSocket or can build a totally custom transport. There's nothing stopping you from, uh, I don't know, spawning a ranch uh, and, and then opening a TCP socket and accepting clients and then accept serialized data and return serialized data. As long as it complies with GraphQL, you can hook it up with uh, the backend server. The other thing, the other cool thing about GraphQL is that you can use it internally within your Elixir application. Not sure how it's done in other languages like Ruby or, or, or JavaScript or Java, but in Elixir you can use uh, GraphQL to query the underlying data from your, let's say, controllers of your services and, and get that data back and do something about it. So you don't have to repeat yourself, repeat the logic when you're building an application twice once to uh, satisfy the needs of the API and then the needs for the, uh, uh, for, for, for the backend application. I, I think we've all heard that story before. It rarely works, but you can try. All right. So, in Elixir, GraphQL is usually, when you're thinking about GraphQL in Elixir, you're usually thinking about the server-side implementation uh, that's called AppSynth. Uh, and Absinthe is one of the most uh, complete implementations of the server side, uh, side of things of GraphQL uh, uh, out there. So it's on pair probably with something that's, that's top in JavaScript or, or in Ruby. Uh, it's architecture in a way that it's a modular toolkit. It has very tiny core that you can sit down and read probably in like two hours and understand most of it. Uh, and then there are additional packages. So we have Absinthe that just Ex parses, executes the queries, and then we have uh, absent plug, that's an adapter for plug, absent Phoenix, etc., etc. Um, it's actively worked and maintained. It's still growing. There are more, more official and unofficial add-ons to it being pop popping up uh, uh, all the time. One thing that's missing, uh, notably missing, is official uh, client. Um, there are third-party clients, but there's no official absent client as of I know, uh, as of the time now. Uh, and Elixir and, 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 and GraphQL is a good match, especially if you're doing subscriptions, uh, right? So if you have subscriptions in place, then, uh, then Elixir uh, is a good match because we have the channels, we have, we're able to handle the connections eff efficiently. Uh, it also sorts out some architectural designs for you, so you can use GraphQL as a replacement for your services layer where you do user validation, validation of data, and, and, and then serialization from and back uh, to the user format. All right, time for some examples. And we're gonna have some uh, code flying over the screens now, so I uh, hope you're ready. Let's say we're building a project management application. And uh, this is actually a simplified version from one of the projects that we have built using GraphQL for the client. Uh, let's say we have users in our system that can register on a platform and then they set up their own projects. They can invite other users to those projects and then they can create tasks within those projects and assign those tasks to some users with, within the project or maybe outside the project. So it's a classic project management application uh, like many uh, like that. Uh, GraphQL on its own doesn't handle authentication, so we can still use something like, well, you can squeeze it in to GraphQL if you really want to, but uh, usually you, you could just use a pl plug, some add plug authentication uh, that sets a connection current user. Uh, I'm just using me here. Uh, and our database tables are just, we have the, the table for users. It has many roles. It belongs to you know, projects and project has many tasks. 
So we can go from my from a user to, to list of my projects and list of all the tasks in those projects and and for the assignment table you would go to uh, my assigned tasks, so the tasks that have been assigned to me, right? That sort of already looks like a graph if you if you think about it. Uh, there are no. Uh, All right, but how, how does it look like when we uh, want to query it? How do we query the data uh, using GraphQL? So I'm using the convention that originated in Relay here, but one of the things I like to do when we're building uh, GraphQL uh, applications is, is that scope the view of the user of, of the data into me. So let's say, uh, uh, me is a current user, what can I see? And everything that I can see is going to be scoped within me. Uh, but I can also fetch data about current user. So if I have this current user being set, I can fetch my ID, can my, fetch my email. Uh, and I can fetch the list of projects I have, and ID and, 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 and the name of this project. And then for each of those projects, I can fetch list of tasks and whether they have been completed or not, right? So that would be some examples of, uh, of queries. I can also use uh, arguments uh, for those edges, for those associations. Like, for example, instead of fetching all of the tasks, I could just fetch tasks that are matching some string. Like, what, ha what, what should I have deployed? And then you can search for deploy across the projects, and then you're going to get some data. Uh, or you can have a list of my tasks that haven't been completed, right? That could be a query that the client issues to, to fetch uh, for me, fetch my tasks that haven't been completed and figure out whether I have free weekend or not, right? Uh, from the uh, uh, server side of things, you can run that, those queries as Elixir strings with an optional variables, uh, just using the absent run. You run it against the schema, which I'm going to talk next. Uh, and you're, you're getting either OK and data, or you're getting an error and errors. So this is a familiar pattern for any Elixir developers. We're getting those familiar tuples. Uh, so absent plays nice with our conventions. And we can very much directly use it like that from our uh, application's server-side code. What data are we retrieving from those queries? Uh, if the response has been successful, I'm going to get some dates. So basically, it's going to be a nested map of maps. Uh, and I'm, I'm only re receiving what I have requested. So I'm getting my information about my email because I asked for it, uh, and the list of my projects. And for each of my projects, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a list of tasks. But I'm not getting uh, my assigned tasks as a separate uh, list of my assigned tasks because I haven't asked for it. There's no avatar URL because I haven't asked for it, although it's in the database. There's no user ID because I don't need it. And there's no project name because I haven't asked for it in the previous query. So uh, I'm only getting what I, what I wanted and nothing more. Uh, and by the way, don't, those uh, fields, they don't all have to come from the database. So we can have like a computed fields, for example, uh, for each project, instead of fetching a list of projects on the client and figuring out how many of those tasks have been completed, how many haven't, I can have a com com uh, computed field that says what's the percent of completed uh, uh, tasks in our API. And uh, it's obviously 99%. So it's just going to take as much as it already took us to wrap this up uh, to, to, to get to 100%. Right. How do you get that stuff installed into Phoenix, into your Phoenix application? You just add this one line, uh, run uh, mixdebs get, it gets installed. Uh, then you have to update a few configuration file, uh, your, uh, your endpoint. Uh, optionally, if you're using subscriptions, uh, you have to start uh, something in a supervision tree in your application callback module. And, and if you're using subscriptions, again, modify your uh, socket you know, to, 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 for the channel support. But the important thing then you add is in your router. So in your router, uh, you're specifying two things. And I'm going to start from the bottom of it. Uh, we define a scope slash API. And we just said that everything that's going to be sent to the slash API and further, we're just going to forward it to the absent plug. And we, we're saying 
it, it should use this schema, which is just an like Elixir module. And behind the scenes, AppSync is going to uh, build its own resolution pipeline uh, that is by default something like 40 steps, by the way. So it, it's doing quite a lot that resembles what uh, the plug is doing, but it's totally independent from, from plug. It's something that, uh, that is specific to AppSynth. Uh, and I'm also mounting a graphical, GraphQL uh, a helper tool that allows me to build and execute queries on the go that's called GraphQL uh, under slash API GraphQL. And then you just have to describe your schema uh, in, in, into this uh, schema.ex file that you, 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 you said uh, use it here. You just have to introduce it. And once you, once you describe your schema inside, your API, API is done, right? Uh, the schema lists objects, queries, mutations, and uh, I have a sadness for you. GraphQL is sort of uh, object-oriented. So uh, is, it, is it not? There's no inheritance. There are some object-oriented properties. But yeah, terminology is that we're dealing with object types. So each node in our uh, graph is going to be an object type. What are objects in GraphQL? Uh, these are compound types that consist of one or more fields. Uh, so for example, if we have uh, a user that's going to be an object uh, because it has an ID, email, and uh, avatar URL, uh, they are used as nodes in this graph uh, of, our, of our API. There's one reserved object type called root query type that's, that's a parent of all of your API. And then below that in the graph, you have maybe user or, or me object, depending on how you, how you specify it. Then probably you have a project and task that's, that matches our example. In addition to objects, we also have scalar types. Scalars are the simple types in GraphQL. Uh, by default, GraphQL defines booleans, floats, in ID, integer, and string. Absent adds several additional ones that you can use, but you don't have to. Uh, so there's a date helper, time helper, decimal, and, and, and a few more. Uh, but you don't have to use those. In fact, you can define, and you probably should define your own scholars, uh, so, so, so that uh, you can control the serialization and deserialization of user input uh, as the users are using the, 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 the API. So you can, for example, specify my date type uh, that is going to be serialized to a string when uh, we output a date to a client uh, and it's going to be taken, uh, uh, taken from string and deserialized and used within application uh, as a date. Uh, this is similar to having an Ecto custom type. So if you, if you, if you, if you worked with Ecto, you could do that on the database uh, um, access layer basically in Ecto. Uh, now you can by, by switching to GraphQL, you can move that app uh, closer to the actual user input and output. So within more of the code of your application, you're dealing with real uh, uh, data types that you're interested in, which in that case is proper date, right? Um, right, so we have object scalars, we have more stuff, we have unions that are objects of different types. That, For example, search results, right? A search result can be one of several things that can be a post, a comment, or whatever, then you could use union. Interfaces are just uh, an object uh, that have a similar subset of data, right? Right, where's the graph? Where's the graph in that? Uh, what I like to do when designing an API using GraphQL is just sit down with a sheet of paper and write those circles and, and figure out what my graph of my data is, what my, what's the graph representing the data is. And, and every single GraphQL API has this root query type on the top. Then we have one edge, in our case, pointing to me. That's my data. Uh, then this me object will have one edge pointing to the projects, and then one edge pointing to tasks. And that maps directly to uh, our query that we've been executing, right? So you can see uh, the query maps directly to, 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 to the graph, so it makes sense to just write it down, and, and then you know what queries you can execute. Uh, 
it maps directly as well to the schema definition. So you have to declare those objects in your schema file. By default, everything goes to the schema file. Uh, so it's a single place where you can define your objects, you define the implementation, your Scala types, whatever, and it can be quite big. Uh, so it, there's, there are ways to split it up into smaller files, but by default, it, it just got, everything got merged into the single file. Uh, so you define your objects with a um, custom macro provided by absent schema module, uh, saying that this is an object of type me, and it has those fields, it has an ID with a required string, uh, uh, that's probably actually gonna be ID, that's, that's an error. Uh, but it has a name that ha cannot be null, it, it, and it's a string. So what that it means is that if, for example, in our database, I'm gonna have a user uh, who registered somehow without a name in our application. And our API is going to attempt to return that uh, user object to the, to the front-end client, it's gonna raise an error because that's not the contract that we agreed to. So the front-end developers can be sure that if there's a successful response from the server uh, and, and it has a user object and I asked for a name, the name is gonna be there, right? So there's some nice validation of the contract between front-end and, and back-end here. Uh, so you can avoid those users with name undefined, undefined, right? Uh, and then we uh, declare our uh, edges uh, as fields as well. So in our graph we have, uh, uh, me has a list of projects, uh, and that's literally what you're, you're saying here, right? That maps, again, directly to our graph. And we do the same with the projects. Uh, we have an object that's a type of project. It has some, some, some fields. It has some, uh, uh, it has some edges as well. Uh, what we can do is to use inline documentation. You have those desk uh, module attributes you can use to, to provide documentation that's going to be available uh, as the schema is as well for our clients through the GraphQL introspection mechanism. So the clients can, can just open this GraphQL tour, for example, and click on the documentation and they will get, oh, those, those, those are the queries I can do, those are the object types and those are the fields with their documentation. That's pretty cool and uh, uh, reduces the you know, feedback loop again. Uh, you do the same with tasks. And our graph maps, again, directly to the uh, response you're gonna get. So the graph is everything. And we just used very, very simple graph. It doesn't have to be that simple. It can get very complicated, in fact. Even for that, that, that small uh, five tables application uh, in database, you can do different things. You can uh, introduce bidirectional edges in this graph. So you can go from uh, from the user to, to their projects and then ask for all the users within those projects, right? Uh, you can have this assignments table exposed through the API and then have bidirectional uh, edges between user and my assigned tasks. Uh, you have roles, right? We said we have roles in, 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 in the original database. So we, have, we can fetch the role of the user and go from the user to my projects through role, and maybe we are gonna have one extra uh, asso association between project to specify who's the owner, um, and then another shortcut. So, you know, this can grow very, very, very quickly and, and can become very hairy. So you can, I'm, 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 I'm trying to say that the schema design is something to think about when you're building a GraphQL API because it's easy to shoot yourself in a foot with GraphQL. It's like, like a bazooka, in fact. So you can go very wrong very, very fast. So maybe, maybe, just maybe, instead of, of the previous example, you would have a direct association between me and my tasks. Um, maybe you have a list of assigned users uh, instead of assignments exposed for, the, for this GraphQL. Maybe, maybe you have a project member, not a, not a user, but a, something that has data of a user plus role in it. So you're roll, rolling up those many-to-many uh, -many associations with those intermediate table into, uh, uh, into one 
uh, GraphQL object. So, uh, and, and then uh, we mentioned interfaces, right? So me, project member, and the signed user, we share the same uh, uh, set of uh, fields. So maybe that's an interface. So, 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 so the client code can re rely on that, right? So, uh, so you know, schema can, 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 can vary and you can, you, can, you, can, you can do it in many, many cases. So we have to think what's the use case <coughs> that my API is going to be used for and uh, design your schema accordingly. It's not enough to expose all the database tables and all the connections between those database tables. That's a recipe for a quick disaster. Right. To reiterate, reiterate, just open the schema, declare your uh, objects and associations between those objects. And uh, one more thing, uh, the root query type is defined by the query macro. And in my case, I just have field me. Uh, that's a type of me. Uh, and that's actually it. So we haven't provided a single line of implementation. But at that point, we can expose our API, go to this GraphQL tool, uh, and you would be able to write some queries. You would be able to click on the docs here uh, to figure out what are the, doc what are the doc documents provided by our API developers. And you can get a feedback from the front-end developers saying, okay, this looks fine, or maybe, oh, but we need something else. So we haven't written a single line of tests, single line of implementation, but we are already ready to give them some documentation, something to play with. And Graph GraphQL tool is so nice that it's going to highlight our errors and uh, say uh, what we can do once we're writing the query, what are the fields, etc. So they get a real feel of the API without actually having the API. Furthermore, uh, we can provide it with a dummy implementation uh, already. So we just, uh, uh, on the fields, if we want to fetch the data, how do you do it? You provide uh, something that's called Resolver, and the resolver is just a free parameters function taking a parent object, a uh, list of arguments if there are any, and something that's called resolution. I'm going to talk about it in a second. And, uh, uh, and just, just stab it out with some fake data like that, and, and then give it back to the, to, the use, to, to the front end team to have a feel of it. Uh, in real life, you would probably load uh, data like that uh, from a database or in similar, similar form. Uh, so, you know, the front-end development team can play with against the real data. And if you want to give them a feel of these associations uh, of the edges and other nodes in the graph, you know, just provide it with a fake data like that. So it's not a real API, but it's, it's not a stub either. This is something in between. This is how our contract for the final API is going to look like. I find that very... Uh, efficient way of, 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 of designing APIs. Right. Uh, also, if you want to resolve any field uh, in this graph, GraphQL uh, AppSynth implementation comes with default resolver that's basically doing map get. So that's why uh, it knows how to uh, render basically this JSON with, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, from, from that thing because the field macro if you don't provide a resolver, it's going to just do map get name. And, and that's precisely why this is a nested uh, struct of structs. But provide it on, on a higher level, your own implementations. And then you can query it, right? So we have already implemented our first uh, uh, GraphQL API this way. All right, so how do you change the data? Again, that's very similar to issuing queries, and that's very similar on our schema. Uh, something that takes care of changing the data is called mutation. And uh, mutations are very similar to, ob well, actually, they, are, they, they, they return type of objects and they take arguments that can be optional or maybe they are not optional. In that case, a validation for null, uh, uh, for the presence of the name uh, of the project we want to create is going to be run against. So. Uh, a client who wants to create a uh, project without a name is going to get an error without us writing a single line of code to check that. Um, right. There's a Phoenix integration where you can query. I actually didn't try that, whether that works, by the way. So, uh, uh, last, time, last, last minute addition. Uh, so, you, you, you can specify in your controllers. 
<laughs> that you want to fetch the data for your controllers using GraphQL, using AppSynth. So you just write this inline, uh, well, well you, can, you can do AppSynth run and then provide it with a string for the query, but it also has this nice feature where you can provide the queries as the module attributes for your controllers. Then before this index action is gonna be executed, the data needed for that action is gonna be fetched. And it works again with mutations as well. So your update actions, uh, index listing show new actions, everything. Uh, can be just sim simple one-liners and then you delegate everything to the uh, GraphQL behind the scenes. GraphQL is not without the problems. Um, and there are some serious problems and the first problem you're gonna stumble upon uh, when you're writing GraphQL APIs is gonna be N plus one queries. And it's a huge problem because uh, if you think about the resolvers by default, if you attempt to load my projects, then for each project, my task, uh, Absent is going to traverse that tree of the query and, and do one thing at a time. So it's gonna fetch my projects, for that project is gonna fetch all of the tasks. And then you're gonna go to next project and fetch the list of the tasks. So it's executing a lot of queries, right? Um, there are ways to avoid that. Graph, uh, Absent gives us uh, uh, two ways, but one way is, is actually simpler. You can get away with a lot by you know, modifying your schema design or thinking about your schema design, but if you, you you're still gonna end up uh, with those n plus one queries anyway. Uh, uh, maybe uh, un unless you have like a flat data that, you know, then why would you use GraphQL? Uh, two ways to to avoid that using uh, absent. One is to use batch, uh, which is predefined resolver that. Uh, will expect you to define a function by ID and you just, just use it in, in your resolver and, and then it will collect this, all of those projects, their IDs, and then in one query execute a SQL query to fetch me those, those tasks by project ID. So we're gonna end up, instead of multiple queries, you're just gonna have one query per level. So one, one for project, one for tasks. Uh, and the other one is to use data loader, which is basically more advanced version of this batch query. Um, this all generates the inquiries. So you still have to be careful about that, right? Because those inquiries, they can grow quite, quite big. And maybe inquiries are not the most performant way in some cases. In some cases they will, but, but sometimes you still want to use joins. So you still can. Uh, you can preload the data in the, one of the top level resolvers uh, using joins and preloads. And that's where the third argument of uh, resolver comes in. It has resolution.path that has the information about currently requested object and also what my, of my ch child objects have been requested. So I can look up uh, down in the query and say, okay, but in, in addition to project, I have been also requested uh, list of my uh, tasks. So I will preload it with join and preload in a single SQL query and that's gonna be awesome and that's actually one of my favorite techniques uh, to do uh, that. Right, use ecto join plus preload. Another semi-related thing is that you're probably building a DOS endpoint and I met GraphQL developers who work with GraphQL for months and then you talk to them and like, how do you avoid uh, building a DOS endpoint? Like, what? Uh, and uh, DOS, I mean, denial of service, uh, it's actually very easy to craft uh, queries that will attempt to load a lot, a lot of data, especially if you have those loops in your uh, schema design. So you, you simply do something like that. Let's say we have edges that are bidirectional in our graph and I ask just a query that loads my list of projects, then for each of those projects, list, list of users and for this list of users, and again, list of projects and then go to users, simple as you know. Uh, and then just do it a few more levels and then execute that query and watch the world burn basically that's gonna exhaust the memory on the server, or maybe it's gonna take forever to do so, so, so the, it can crash the Beam virtual machine, and you know, that, that can be a disaster. So, and there's always gonna be a smart user who's gonna try to do that, right? Um, and uh, Absent comes with a DOS prevention mechanisms. Uh, it has a built-in mechanism. Uh, uh, 
that analyzes complexity of the issued queries and just for each field it adds uh, some number to overall query complexity. So if you request uh, a lot of associations, then it's gonna say that all oh, this query is too complex, we cannot execute it. And you can specify yourself for each edge, for each field, how complex in terms of numerical complexity it is. It's just an arbitrary number. It has some defaults, but you can say uh, queries above complexity 35 are not gonna be uh, executed. It sums up uh, those, uh, uh, those numbers and, and, and this allows those queries. Other thing you can do is uh, just monitor uh, your, uh, your processes to make sure that they're not using uh, too much memory and time limits, et cetera. That can be a bit tricky, that can be a problem. Uh, the problem, again, the third problem with GraphQL that I stumbled upon is caching. Like how do you do caching? If you're sending all the queries to post slash API, uh, how do you do HTTP caching on that? Well, the answer is you don't. Uh, instead, you, uh, you rely on uh, client-side caching, and uh, in, in JavaScript there's a wonderful library called Apollo, and uh, it, it's awesome on client-side caching things. Uh, you can also cache some stuff on the, within your resolvers in your implementation, something like CacheX or whatever. Uh, there's another mechanism that I'm not gonna talk about, but there is to issue the queries using a get and the hash of the query instead of full query, so you're saving some bandwidth, and you can cache those APIs, and this is supported by Absent. Uh, another uh, problem I, I stumbled upon is hostile development environments. Uh, you know, JavaScript is, is as a language, is quite bad, but it's actually not that bad. Uh, Apollo, the library is super awesome on, on top of it. It's very good client-side library. Absent is, again, awesome, but not everybody's as lucky as we are, right? So there are, for example, mobile developers um, that a lot, in a lot of cases have to deal with poor, incomplete client-side, uh, client's implementation for, uh, for GraphQL and uh, uh, even in Elixir, uh, trying to find a graph, good GraphQL client can be a, a tricky part. Uh, and non-dynamic languages, you know, you have those objects, you have types, etc. then you have to deal with generated code. Developers might not like that. They say, oh, just give me a JSON and I'm gonna parse it as a, as a map, right? What's the problem? Uh, so in my experience, for some reason, mobile app developers often don't like uh, GraphQL or they openly say they hate it. Uh, so just built in REST endpoints for them. Where to learn about GraphQL, because I, I just scratched the surface, uh, just get this book. Like, I mean, uh, it, it's up to date, it's been re quite recently released, uh, so it's in line with the recent versions of Absent. At the moment, it's a good time to learn uh, GraphQL in Elixir from that book precisely. They're not paying me, by the way, uh, for that. But this is my recommendation. Get that and, uh, and read it through. It goes through the whole process from the backend design of the API to uh, uh, even using Apollo JavaScript client library. That's probably your best uh, guess in terms of uh, learning GraphQL at the moment. All right, thank you. Uh,